service. Five minutes. Five minutes. Good Sunday morning to you, friends. Welcome back to the Red River Meeting House. I'm honored that you've taken the time to join me this morning for church service. We are here in the historic site of the beginning of the Second Great Awakening, the revival of 1800, which actually began in the, the late 1700s, the 17, 1797, 1799, along in there. And, uh, and we, we celebrate that as we, as we meet uh, here in this location. This is a place that God did a mighty work. And we pray, we pray earnestly that God will again do a mighty work in our hearts and bring revival once again to our land. Join me this morning as I share with you the collect for this morning. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Join me this morning as we, as we turn to the book of Psalms. Psalm 19. This is a familiar psalm. You're going to recognize the last verse if you've watched me do service over the last 15, 16 years, you're going to recognize the last verse of, of this. But let's look at the entire psalm, Psalm 19. This is a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. There is nothing hidden from its heat. 
The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his own errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength, my shelter, my rock, and my redeemer. You join me this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for who you are. We are bringing our, our feeble praise to you, uh, seeking to understand you better day by day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your law. We thank you for your commandments. And in them we see who you are. Father, lead and guide us is our prayer this day. Lead us into the truth of your word. Lead us by that into the truth of who you are. And as I am wont to pray, may the words of our mouths and may the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you join me this morning as we sing a hymn of praise to the Lord?
again, want to go to the Lord in prayer. We want to, uh, to, to bring our, our requests to Him. This is, this is, is what we do when we, when we gather together. This is what we do when we come to church. Uh, Jesus says to cast our cares upon Him, for He cares for us. I, I want to mention uh, primarily this morning uh, a prayer for the family, uh, the wife, the family of uh, Bob, Bob Rogers. Pray for, pray for Kathy, his wife. Uh, Bob is a, is a reenactor from Springfield, Ohio area. He primarily did, did 1812, I believe, uh, but he has passed away this week uh, after a battle with cancer. Uh, the report came to me that, that Bob was ready to go home, and we thank God for that report, knowing what he means by that. Services uh, for Bob are going to be tomorrow, uh, September 21st in Springfield, Ohio, and if you want more information on that, feel free uh, to contact, contact me. Lord willing, I, we should see some of you, some of you there uh, tomorrow. We want to pray also for, for our, our country. We want to pray for uh, the unrest, uh, the violence and such that we see in, in, in our country, the destruction uh, and, and, and all that is involved there. We want to pray for those in leadership in, in our country, that, that God will use them in accordance with His will. We want to pray for uh, our men and women uh, in uniform that stand in our, in our defense in, in foreign lands, that stand in our defense here in our land. And let us, let us pray for, for those in, in law enforcement too. We want to pray for uh, sickness that still disrupts life. Uh, daily, it seems, we, we get a report of someone that, that, is, that is very ill, whether it be of the virus, which is very common to hear, or of, of others uh, that, are, that are ill. So we, we want to pray. We want to pray that, that the Lord will, will be with us in that, be with those that are suffering. We want to pray for those that are unemployed, uh, that have no visible means of, of support at, at this time. And this is a challenge uh, for us in, in where we have the means to be able to, to lend a hand, then do so. Uh, that, is, that is something that I believe Scripture requires us to do. We want to pray uh, similarly for, for businesses uh, that are hurt. We want to pray for churches. We want to pray for churches that are being, being affected by, by error and by heresy. And we want to pray that, that God's word will, will be plainly proclaimed uh, throughout the world. Would you join me this morning as we again go to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we are, uh, we are grateful again, uh, praising you for who you are. We are grateful for your love, for your mercy. We are grateful for all that you have done through your Son, Jesus Christ. You have offered and you have completed our salvation, and we thank you for that. Father, for, for, for the family of Bob Rogers, for his friends, the ones that are missing him so, so dearly at, at this point, including, including us, we are, we are asking that you comfort in, in those uh, that are suffering in this time. We, we ask, as we have mentioned, numerous requests that, that you will uh, guide and direct in all these things. It's your will will be done. And Heavenly Father, I am, I am mindful that while I am here praying and others are hearing uh, the sound of my voice, that they too are praying and lifting their requests to you, dedicating themselves to you, seeking help from you, asking uh, for you to meet the needs according to your riches in glory. So, Heavenly Father, we lift these things to you in, in thankful praise, knowing that you love us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you join me as we pray that prayer uh, that, uh, that Jesus prayed, instructing his disciples, our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would like for us this morning to 
consider some passages out of the book of Romans. Uh, the letter that, uh, that Paul wrote to those there in, in, in Rome. This is, this is an important treatise. This is, is, is an important uh, grouping of, of verses and, and chapters as we see them in, in our Bibles uh, today. It is, it is an important treatise for our theology. It contains uh, important doctrine. Uh, and, 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 and this, this should, should, not, should not scare you, for understand that I'm, that I'm not going to dig into the, 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 the bowels, as it were, of this, of this letter and bring out the obscure, but I want to bring out the plain and the, and the obvious today. I want to bring out this. This is, this is a letter that, that, that Paul wrote to we Gentiles. Now, yes, there were, there were his own countrymen there, there in Rome. But the, but the majority of the folk there were, were, like, were like us and, and were, were not Jewish. They were, they were Gentiles. If you were not Jewish, you were a Gentile. So the rest of the world is, is Gentile. Uh, this uh, makes, it, makes it easy to understand some of the, some of the wording that, that he uses. But, but those throughout the ages have, have seen the importance of, of this letter to Romans. Martin Luther wrote a commentary to, to the book of Romans. And, and in, this, in this commentary, he wrote a preface to this, to this letter. John Wesley, in the late 1730s, found himself in a Moravian meeting uh, there at Aldersgate Street in, in London. And they were reading. They were reading this introduction. I'm not going to read the entire introduction, but only, only a part of it. But they were reading this introduction that Luther wrote to Romans. And this is the point that Wesley counts as his moment of conversion. This is, this is when Wesley says, I felt my heart strangely warmed by the realization of who Christ is and what he came on earth to do. This, this preface starts this way, the first few lines. This letter, Romans, this letter is truly the most important piece in the New Testament. It is purest gospel. It is well worth a Christian's while not only to memorize it word for word, but also to occupy himself with it daily, as though it were the daily bread of the life of the soul. It is impossible to read or meditate on this letter too much or too well. The more one deals with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Well, what is this book of Romans? Let's consider for a few moments, and I would want to bring four points out of, out of this book of Romans. Uh, first would be the illustration of our need. Secondly would be the illustration of justification. Third would be the expectation of justification. And fourthly, the realization of justification. What is justification? You might ask. Justification is a technical term. Justification is a person being set free from the thing that they, that they are. Just as if I had never sinned is, is a, a, a simplified illustration of justification, but it is a, but it is a, it is a, it is a, technical, a technical term. We are justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are justified and able to stand in the presence of of God. So what is this? Now again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going, to, I'm not going to, to go through all the chapters, uh, not this morning, but, uh, but I, I want to pick, I want to pick some, some highlights, and, and, and in doing so, one, for brevity, and, and two, when we pick highlights from, from Scripture, we have to look at the context around it, and we don't pick one verse and say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God without explaining what is going on around it. So we want, we want to see enough of that. The illustration of our need in, in, in the first place. And this, this does come, this does come from, from Romans the third, the third chapter. There is no distinction. No distinction between Jew and Greek. No distinction between any other classes when it, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no superior, there is no inferior. We are all in sin. 
We are all lost. We are all equal in this. He says in, in verse 22 of, of chapter 3, the last part of the verse, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But uh, the all-important word in, when we're dealing with, with us, when we see who we are, then we say, but Christ, but God is the one that, that saves us. So verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24, but they are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is, this is an introduction. This is the, 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 the first part of the letter. The chapter 1, chapter 2 are, are describing in great detail who we actually are. They are describing that, that we are a people that have turned from God. And, and this is not new to the, the church in Rome. This is, this is in common with, with all of history. All the way from, from, from Adam and Eve, all the way to the, the completion, we are the same. We have not recognized God as God, and therefore we are condemned. We are condemned because of our own action. Or we are, in fact, sometimes condemned because of our own inaction. But we are, nevertheless, there is no distinction for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 25, God publicly displayed him at his death as the mercy seat accessible through faith. The mercy seat, this is an Old Testament idea. It is, it is the, the seat that was on top of the, the ark. It was the place there in the most holy place in the temple. And God publicly displayed Christ at his death as being the one that is going to forgive our sins. Where then is boasting? Do we boast in our own work? Do we boast because we're better than somebody else? Do we boast because... We have it and some others don't know. We do not boast. There is no boasting in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not of our works, lest any man should boast. No, but this is a principle of faith. So we see, we see that, that, that there is a, a building of a, of a foundation, a building of a foundation for our need for Jesus Christ. In the second place, the illustration of our justification. Uh, Romans chapter 4, you see, we've come from who we are, the situation we're in in Romans 1 and 2, declared that we're all sinful, Romans 3, and here we're seeing an illustration of justification. Romans 4, 3, for what does, it, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now this is a direct quote from Genesis chapter 15. And if you've listened to me very long, you know that Genesis chapter 15 contains a beautiful picture of, of our redemption. It is a, a foreshadowing of what, of what Christ did upon the cross. And this is, this is when God made the covenant with Abraham. And God signed the covenant and Abraham did not. But because of what took place, we realize the a covenant was signed by both parties. A covenant that said that if I break my part of the covenant, may what happen to the animals that we have sacrificed and laid side by side and walked between, may what happened to them happen to me. My point in saying that, that Abraham did not sign the covenant is that he fell asleep. And God himself walked through those pieces, signing, signing the covenant for both himself and Abraham, effectively saying to Abraham, if I break my part of the covenant, may what happens to these animals that we've that we sacrificed and laid side by side, may what happened to them happen to me. But Abraham, if you break your part of the covenant, may what happened to these animals happen to me. And this is what we see coming on the cross. This is Jesus on the cross because we did and we continually break our part of the covenant. Romans 4.23, but the statement, it was credited to him, was not only written for Abraham's sake, but also for our sake, to whom it will be credited. 
those who believe in the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He ha was given over because of our transgression and was raised for the sake of our justification. You see, this is, this is the, the justification illustrated. Now, I, I, I wonder if, if Jesus could not have died in, in private and, and accomplished our, our salvation. I, I, I really don't, don't, don't think so, but, but in a way it is, our, it is our visual, our seeing this, our seeing the picture of it, our seeing the picture of it with Abraham, our seeing the picture of it with Jesus literally on the cross in excruciating pain excruciating, a word that comes from, from crucifixion. And, and X, the prefix to that, magnifies, magnifies that, that, that pain. But he was given over because of our transgression and raised for the sake of our justification. Now we just went through uh, John, the Gospel of John. We just completed that on Wednesday night. We just threw it through the 21st chapter. So we have seen... Uh, we have seen Jesus crucified, buried, resurrected. Uh, and if we went on into the, to the book of Acts, we would see, we would see the, the ascension uh, in, into heaven. And, and all of this was, was so that we could see. This is an illustration. Well, if, we're, if, we, have, if we have a need and we have, we have an illustration, then do we have an expectation of, of justification? And this is... This is Romans chapter 5. Now again, Romans, Romans is, is, is kind of taking us up, taking us up a, a, a ramp to be able to, to enter into the city. We, we built a siege ramp and we're, and we're coming and we have to, we have to climb as we, as, as we go up. And, and each one of these is, is a step further to, to reach our, our goal, which will be, which will be point, point four. But here in point three, the expectation of justification, Romans Chapter 5, a, a more extended ver, uh, uh, section here. Therefore, since we have been uh, declared righteous by faith, remember, Abraham was declared righteous. This was written for us, that through our faith, Hebrews says that no one comes to, to, to Christ except by faith. It is by faith that we realize our, our justification, and, and this is the, the act that, that brings us into a right relationship, a righteousness with with God through, through Christ. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember we talked last week about peace. Christ said, I came to bring peace, not as the world get, uh, knows, but I've come to bring peace, a lasting peace, an eternal, eternal peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom, verse 2, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into His grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of God's glory. Not only this, but we also rejoice in sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. Did you hear that? And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Verse 6 then. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Who's that? Let's go back to chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. That's all of us, right? We are all ungodly. And we are helpless. We are helpless because there is nothing that we can do outside of Christ to affect our salvation. There is nothing we can do outside of Christ to make us into a right relationship with God. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7, this is a parenthetical statement here. For rarely will someone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, perhaps someone might possibly dare to die. And this brings to mind the, uh, the verse from John, a greater love hath no money than this, that a man lay down his life for his, for his friends. And we know that, that while there are people that, that do this, this is talking about Christ. This is talking about Christ. Christ 
had no concern over who they were. They were ungodly. We are ungodly, and He has died for us. Verse 8, But God demonstrates His own love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say, you've got to be better, and then I'm going to die for you. He didn't say, well, if, if I see promise in, in your life, then my death will be effective uh, for you. No, He died for all, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse, uh, verse 8 again, But God demonstrates His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, Much more than because we have been declared righteous by His blood, we will be saved through Him from God's wrath. This, this wrath is not a capricious wrath. This wrath is not uh, of an angry God. This is not Jesus saying, Father, I'll, I'll go to the cross in, 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 in their place so that, so that your anger will be poured out on me and not on, not on them. No, that, that's, that's not a correct picture. Look at the look at the at the correct picture that that this very event was put forth. This very event was planned from before the foundations of the earth. God knew. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Those that brooded over creation, those that were there and said, Let us make man in our image. These are the ones that set in place our salvation and eternity past. So that in the proper time. Christ would die for us. This was, this was painful for, for, for the Son. This was painful for the Father. This was surely painful for the Spirit in, in that this, took, this event took place. And to say that it saved us from God's wrath means that it saved us from the punishment that we duly deserve for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 10, For if, we, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, how much more, since we have been reconciled, will we be saved by His life? Not only this, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received this reconciliation. What is this reconciliation? This is the point of the entire Bible. The entire Bible is put for us to see God bringing, him, bringing us, bringing mankind back to Himself. And in this, it is showing us that, that we have the illustration, we have the expectation, and that indeed this has been done. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Note this, the love that comes from God and produces our love for God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's love is even the love that allows us to be able to love Him and to be able to love each other understanding of our sin, if we have the illustration of our justification, the expectation of our justification, then what is the realization of our justification? Again, this, this book is giving us a lot of important, important doctrine, and, and I've chosen today to deal with, with the obvious. There are, there are layers that we can go, we can go deeper, and I would, I would invite you uh, to, to do what Luther says and, and, and deal with this deal with this book daily. It's only 16 chapters. It can be read in, 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 a short, in a short time. But in Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 12, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is by the law. The one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says... Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? And this is a quote. This is a quote from Moses. The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith 
which we preach. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and thus has righteousness. And with the mouth one confesses and thus has salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction. Remember when we read this in chapter 3. There is no distinction. Here in chapter 10, verse 12, For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, who richly blesses all who come to Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, this is an Old Testament passage. Uh, the passage uh, that that he is referring to that 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 Paul is referring to is in is in Deuteronomy the uh, the thirtieth chapter, where where Moses is writing. See, I have set before you life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways, by keeping His commandments and His statutes and His rules, then you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the, in the land where you are going over the Jordan to enter and to possess. I call on heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice, holding fast to Him. For He is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers and to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This is, this is the salvation that Moses is looking forward to. This is the salvation that Paul is showing us that has taken place just, just 27 years previous to his writing here. He's, but he quotes the Old Testament. He brings that into us so that we can understand. And the other passage that he's, that he's quoting is the prophet Joel. And this is the, this is the prophet that, that Peter quotes uh, on the day of Pentecost. Joel 2, verses 28 to 32 and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. This is a prophecy of that day of Pentecost. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your older men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, even on the male and female servants. In those days I will pour out my Spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes a prophecy verse 32 Joel chapter 2 and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved this is this is significant this calling upon up upon the Lord who what is it to say Jesus is Lord one of my one of my old professors who's now gone gone to be with the Lord, says that, that the saying Jesus is Lord is one of the earliest creeds, if not the earliest creed. Some think this, this rose up in a time of persecution there, 200 uh, to 300, but, but its roots go, go much deeper. The Greek word translated Lord is kurios, and it serves both as, as an expression of respect, sir, we would refer to a person in authority over us as my Lord, uh, would, would, would we not? But it also has another meaning. For in the 6,000 times in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, that, that was translated, the one that Jesus quoted from, the one that Paul and the apostles quoted from, 6,000 times they, they, they translate that word as, as kurios. And that word is known as God, the Lord God. So the confession to say Jesus is Lord is to say Jesus is indeed God. The roots go deep 
on this. And the, the intensity of this declaration must also be, be understood. For indeed, there in, in those, those times in the second, third, fourth century, that if you met someone in the street of Rome and he declared G, uh, Caesar is Lord and you answered Jesus is Lord, you were putting Jesus on the same level as Caesar in their, in their minds. And this, this would very likely be a death sentence for you. So this is not something that is said lightly. This is not something that is just a flippant statement. And this is what we see when we call on the name of the Lord. Because righteousness comes by faith. It matters not whether the believer is Jew or Gentile. The same Lord blesses all who call to Him. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now I'm standing here in the Red River Meeting House and we are, we are portray, portraying uh, the year approximately of, of 18, 1800. I want to take you forward in, into your history and into our history a, a little bit uh, into the year of, of about 18, 1880. And I want to take you to, to the Metropolitan uh, Tabernacle in, in London. And there the pastor, uh, very, very famous uh, minister named Charles Spurgeon, he gives the ending of a sermon similar to the one, the one that, I've, that I've preached. I haven't, I haven't plagiarized Spurgeon yet. I am preparing to do so because I want you to understand, I want you to hear the words that, that have been spoken historically and, ha and, and encourage us in our making Jesus Lord. How do we confess with our mouth? What does this look like? What does this sound like? And there's really not a convenient place to, to jump into Spurgeon's sermon here, but let me, let me start. This is the last couple of, uh, of paragraphs, or it's within the last paragraph of his sermon, the title of which, or the, the scripture of which, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Spurgeon says, and this is the mystery of it, that the guilty are not willing to be parted from their sins. They will not seek that which alone is their life, their joy, their salvation. They prefer hell to heaven, sin to holiness. Never spake the master a word, this is God, never spake the master a word in observation more clearly than when he said, ye will not come to me that ye may save your life. This is chapter, uh, John chapter 5, verse 39. You will attend your chapels, but you will not call on the Lord. Jesus cries. This again is John 5, 39. So these are the words of Christ. Ye search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. But ye will not come to me, that ye may have life. What does Jesus say? Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. Back to Spurgeon. You will do anything rather than come to Jesus. You stop short of calling upon him. Oh, my dear hearers, do not let it be so with you. Many of you are saved. I beseech you to intercede for those that are not saved. Oh, that the unconverted among you may be moved to pray. Before you leave this place, breathe an earnest prayer to God, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I need to be saved. Save me. I call upon thy name. And then, and then Spurgeon does a wonderful thing. Uh, the, the scripture tells us to call upon the Lord, to come to him in, in faith, but it does not give us a, an, an incantation to say. It does not give us a... Uh, you say these words and I will do, I will do that. It says, it says prayer. Prayer is, is talking to God. Prayer is a communication with God. And very often, very often we get into the, to the heat of battle, as it were. And we are so convinced of our sin and convicted that perhaps our, our minds can't formulate a word to say. And Spurgeon gives us something here. He says... Pray this, I entreat you, join me while I put words in your mouths and speak them on your behalf.
by half. He's not, he's, he can't affect our salvation. Spurgeon can't affect our salvation. I can't affect your salvation. But I can, I can tell you this is what a prayer might look like. And he entreats them to pray with him. Lord, I am guilty. I deserve thy wrath. Lord, I cannot save myself. Lord, I would have a new heart and a right spirit, but what can I do? Lord, I can do nothing. Come and work in me to will and to do of thy good pleasure. Spurgeon quotes a verse of an Isaac Watts hymn. Thou alone hast power, I know, to save a wretch like me. To whom or whither should I go if I should turn from thee? He continues, but, but I now do from my very soul call upon thy name, trembling yet believing. I cast myself wholly upon thee, O Lord. I trust the blood and righteousness of thy dear Son. I trust thy mercy and thy love and thy power as they are revealed in him. I dare to lay hold upon this word of thine, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, save me today for Jesus' sake. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. We thank you that we can read this, and we can understand this. We thank you that you directed men like Paul to write these things down. We thank you supremely for your Holy Spirit that makes these things alive in our hearts, for your Holy Spirit that you told your disciples that he would come and, 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 and comfort us, and he would also come and convince the world of our sin. So we pray, Heavenly Father, that you send your spirit into each one of our hearts to convict us, to convince us that our heart is not right with you, to convict us and convince us that we come to you in prayer, thanking you for who you are, thanking you for what you've done for us. Heavenly Father, this day, I pray this prayer for myself. I pray this prayer for my friends that are watching. I pray this prayer for, for all that that would desire to come to you. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you, you lead and guide those that, that remain rebellious, those whose hearts are hardened. Father, we ask that you, that you soften those hearts, that you bring them to yourself. Heavenly Father, we are, we are mourning the loss of, of, of one friend. We are thankful uh, that his testimony is that, that, that he was ready to come home to you. And, and this, is, this is, is grace, and this is, this is mercy. But Heavenly Father, we, we all face eternity, and we look around us, and there are those that, that are, are close by, that, that want nothing to do with you, and our desire, Heavenly Father, is to see them come, come to you, to answer your call, to come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for the ones that are watching. I thank you for the ones that, that, that join with us faithfully. And I ask that you continually draw us closer to yourself. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I'd like to leave you uh, today with the benediction to the book of Romans. And, and this, is, this is at the conclusion. The last, the last couple of chapters are our, our application. The last few chapters are application, starting chapter 12. And then he gets personal, uh, naming, naming those that are, that are followers of his, naming those that are in difficulty, and, and drawing them closer to himself. And he closes the book thusly. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed through the prophetic writings 
has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to thank you again for, for taking the time to join with me. It is, it is an honor uh, to, see, to see your faces uh, in, in, in church this morning. I want to invite you uh, to come back again on, on Wednesday night. Uh, as I said in the sermon, we have, we have completed the Gospel of John, uh, and those are there on the, on, on the Facebook page if you want to go in and, and, and catch up on, on any of them. Uh, but we're going to transition from there into the epistles of John, 1 John, 2 John, and and third John. So join me, join me Wednesday night as we'll get a little bit of a historic background of, of the book, of the writings, and of the man that, that wrote them, and then we will, we will jump into the text uh, itself. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, is our prayer. Amen.